as Monica said, this is the NGINX workshop. We're going to be looking at two different NGINX open source projects, NGINX unit and the uh, far more well-known uh, NGINX uh, web server reverse proxy. So this is what we're going to do in this workshop. And this workshop is a double format. So we're going to take the, the first 45 minutes looking at NGINX unit, and we're going to take the second 45 minutes looking at NGINX plus. So we'll have uh, the, the 50 minute break in the middle uh, as per the agenda. But this is essentially a double workshop session. Uh, it will make sense if you just want, if you can only stay from one or both parts, but uh, that's, we're going to use uh, you know, an hour and 45 minutes with a lot to get through. So what we're going to do with this workshop is we're going to uh, build APIs and run those using NGINX unit. And then we're going to use NGINX as an API gateway in front of those systems. Uh, so that's the self-basic diagram. My name is Liam Crilly. Uh, I am a product manager for NGINX uh, and the uh, NGINX Plus product. And Timo is joining me from Germany, who is going to be uh, he's a product manager engineer who is uh, kind of heavily involved in the NGINX unit. So here's the agenda. I will do a quick introduction to NGINX uh, and the history. And then I'll hand it over to Timo and he will take you through to running APIs with NGINX unit. Uh, we will have a Q&A towards the end of this first 45 minute session. Um, however, uh, because there's two of us, we can handle questions in the chat, as Monica said, uh, quite easily. So we'll hope to make this interactive as possible. If you have a question, fire it in there. Uh, and whilst Timo is speaking, I'll try and answer. Uh, and he will do the same for me a little later on. We'll take a break. Uh, the 15 minutes in between uh, the two main workshop sessions, and then we'll get on to deploying NGINX web server as an API gateway. So we'll be uh, extending the work that Timo does with the API runtime, uh, and we'll be then essentially taking to production using NGINX as a reverse proxy as well, API gateway. Again, we'll leave some Q&A time right at the end, um, but please do, uh, make this as interactive as possible. I think it's better for everybody uh, and just keep your questions flying. Timo, you wanna say hello before we uh, get started? Sure, thanks Liam. Um, yeah, so thanks um, for the short introduction and hello from my side to anybody's joined at this session. Um, yes, yeah, Liam said just one more word about it's a workshop. It's not like uh, something we, we get talking for the next one hour, 45 minutes. Uh, so if you have questions, feel free to ask, and um, I'll put a lot of stuff in my, my demo. We do a lot of interactive things um, to make it as interesting as possible. So looking forward to it. Thanks, Dima. Okay, so let's start off just with a quick introduction to NGINX. Um, now, actually, before I start, or as I start, um, let me bring, make sure I can see my chat window here. There it is. So NGINX started, well, uh, quite, a, quite a while ago now with, with one guy, Igor Sisoyev, uh, who was working at the time as a, uh, a sysadmin, really, or a, a web admin. Probably these days you'd call him a site reliability engineer, uh, SRE. And he was running the Apache web servers for a Russian internet portal service, kind of like Yahoo of the day, uh, called Ramba. And he was, uh, that was a web portal in Russia and the Apache servers at the time, the internet was going you know, through one of its huge periods of explosive growth and the Apache web servers just couldn't handle the amount of traffic and it was causing Igor real headaches. And so he set out to solve that. Basically, how could he you know, handle more concurrent connections with a single server? Uh, at the time there was a, a computer science problem called the C10K problem, how to handle 10,000 concurrent connections on a single server hardware box. Uh, so Igor took a slightly different approach or a very different approach to the way that Apache was implemented at the time and came up with NGINX, uh, which blew away his original goal and was able to cope with huge loads uh, by using uh, an event loop and asynchronous architecture at the heart of NGINX. So NGINX is a very popular open source project, just to get a sense if everyone in on the session could go in the chat and send a message to 
panelists and attendees and just type yes or no if you have heard of nginx or used nginx in the past it will, it will be helpful later for when we go through the workshop side cool seeing some answers fantastic keep them coming oh lots of yeses all right fantastic so we've heard of it let's do something interesting with it now just to bring you kind of up to date so that original open source release was back in 2004 a while ago now, but it took another three years. This was a side project for Igor uh, yeah, from his day job. Uh, he thought it was viable in his own words uh, three years later, 2007. And then another three years passed before we actually went from 0.9 to 1.0. So Nginx version one was released on the 12th of April, 2011. Uh, and from there, we started to see uh, you know, really tremendous growth and uh, uh, the documentation site had been translated to English by then, so that was helping uh, grow adoption. Uh, now, fast forward to 2018, Nginx unit is released. Nigel, sorry, Timo will speak to this in more detail, uh, but it was also released on the 12th of April, uh, which is the International Day of Human Spaceflight, as uh, Igor Sosoya is uh, quite a space fan. So that kind of brings us up to date. Uh, I haven't extended the timeline to this year because I think we'd all rather forget this year if it happened. So let's just leave it at 2019 where Nginx is hugely popular running um, the majority of the websites on the internet and Nginx unit is now emerging as uh, a next generation application server. So with that, let's get into the workshop content and I will hand it over to Timo and uh, Timo will pick up the presenting. So I will go on mute and look out the questions. I'll speak to you later. Thanks, Liam. So I go ahead and continue, share. So I move the chat window a little bit out of the way. Um, yes, so as I said, um, we'll do a little bit of a of an Nginx unit walkthrough. Um, go ahead and talk about the basic concept of unit, what it is, how to configure, how to install. Um, yeah, then we'll build three different um, small JavaScript-based APIs and deploy them on an AWS EC2 instance via the ECR container registry. Um, so what we're going to build in this, in this step is this, this box at the very right of this picture. Um, we want to, we'll go ahead and create um, three different APIs um, hosted on Nginx unit in a Docker container, um, and that, that will publish this APIs to um, AWS. Yeah, as Liam said, the, the Nginx unit is a polyglot application server, a reverse proxy, as well as a static file server, as you know from, from Nginx, where you can serve HTML, JavaScript, and CSS files. Um, and uh, yeah, well, what does it mean? So what is what are all the all the features we have in place here? Um, so the most important thing is that Igor's vision about how to run an, a next generation web server at, at the time he started with Nginx open source um, was the same, still the same vision when he started to yeah, create this Nginx unit application server or when, when he started to, to develop this. And so that means everything that was in the, in the core of Nginx at this point was put into the unit project as well. So all the ideas, all the visions, all the concepts about performance, security, simplicity, it's, it's all part of Nginx unit as well. And I'll go ahead and share a couple of um, insights about the architecture, the system architecture um, from unit. Let me just go ahead and click my start watch here. I'll make sure I stay in time. Um, so let's let's talk a little bit more about what, what it means by flexible. So flexible means that the, the Nginx unit application server is fully configurable via a uh, REST API. So you can send the configuration to the unit app server just by curling and, and specific HTTP endpoint and sending the API in a JSON format. 
So this is this is definitely um, a, a big change uh, instead of the of the nginx configuration you know from from today. And yeah, so at the moment we support eight different languages, starting from assembly, Go, Java, um, JavaScript. This is something we'll see today. PHP, Perl, Python, and Ruby. They act a little bit different. It's, it's depending on the way we are, we can implement um, the language features. Um, but I'll go ahead and, and share this in a minute with you. Um, so what about the security features? I mean, security is, is all around the place, especially when it comes to cloud architecture. Um, security is a, is a key figure um, at this time. So we have a couple of options where we can secure our application stack um, by hosting them on unit. One is that we can put TLS certificates or SSL certificates into unit and configure them dynamically. So we can send and update and change certificates on the fly without reloading any processes. And can, or what we can achieve with this is that we can enforce an encryption on the transport layer um, to our applications. So this is, a, this is very easy to configure and uh, I can show you this if, if we have time after the workshop. Um, and another or a couple of another security features at this point um, are that the client connections or the, 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 the processes where we handle our client connections for each application are isolated. Um, we'll see this in an example here. And with the newer releases of Nginx unit, we introduced uh, something like system namespaces isolation and file system isolation. Um, and about the performance, as I said, this is the same vision, the same ideas from Nginx is now an Nginx unit. So it's the, it's the same approach. We're doing asynchronously, um, we we'll work asynchronously, and we're still at this point where the 10K mark is, is always, always in place. So we want to handle 10,000 simultaneous connections um, with the lowest amount of memory. Um, so this is, these are very, very key figures of Nginx unit. Be flexible and simple, be secure, and keep the performance as high as possible. So let's dive into a little bit of the system architecture of, of unit before we're going to, to do the, the API work. Um, so we, the, the Nginx unit contains out of a couple of processes. One is the controller and the main process, and then the router process and the couple of worker threads or the application processes. The controller process, as you can see on, on top here, is our configuration endpoint where we can send our configuration to. The main process is sending the configuration to, yeah, to, to the instance and, and uh, doing the, the main work. And the router process is a very interesting thing, but let's dive into this a little bit later. Um, as I said, the controller process takes care of about our configuration. And by default, the controller process um, will listen on a Unix socket, but you can change this if really needed to be an, an port. So then you can send your, your JSON configuration to an port instead of a socket. It's well documented on the website, um, unit.nginx.org. So feel free to check it out. Per default, it is a Unix socket. So any configuration change you send to the controller process will be checked by the controller. And in case it's valid, it will send to the main process to get processed and to, to reconfigure the instance. The router process here um, is, is interesting because the router process is the more or less your the, the process taking care of the HTTP connections from the client side. The controller process takes care of the connections from our side, from the sysadmin side for the configuration changes. And the router process is the exposed process if you want to take care of the, of the client connections from the outside world. And it contains a main thread and a couple of worker threads, depending on how many applications uh, you have configured. But we'll see this in our workshop. I have a demo where you can see how that, how that looks like. 
Um, but the router process is a very important thing to know about that all the client connections, everything we send from the client side to unit will be handled by the router process. Um, and that enables us to configure some, some routing policies, we call them measures, um, on unit. And this is something I'll go ahead and see in a minute. So this is how that works. So we have a client connection and request to the router process. Um, and then we configure two different applications. And as we encapsulate uh, like the language modules um, in unit modules, most of them in that case PHP, we can run, for example, PHP 5, PHP 7, Node.js or JavaScript and Ruby applications all on the same instance. And um, unit can dynamically make use of them um, and of the underlying system architecture to configure or route, yeah, to configure the application and route the traffic to the to the right applications at the time it's 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 requested. So that means the polyglot application server, we can use unit to host our supported languages, eight of them, on the same unit instance on the same system without having another main unit process up and running. So the main unit process will take care of all eight different languages. And this is an, a Go example, but this is kind of the same logic than for um, Node.js. It's the left part is, your, is the, yeah, the out of the box way if you want. So let's rewrite this here on the fly to, to Node.js. Um, I mean, Node.js brings an, an own HTTP server, if you want, with it, uh, we could use. But the way of the, so the implementation, how Node.js implemented the HTTP server and how our unit router process in our modules implemented the HTTP server is at this point very different. Um, the Node.js one is mostly written in JavaScript and our HTTP processor is uh, written mostly in C. And with, yeah, with the router process we have here, we have a lot of flexibility. We can configure the route measures, we can configure a lot of different things. Um, and as we have this router on top of our application of the language stack, the router configuration is independent from the language the application is written in. So, the route configuration is always the same structure, is always the same schema, the same syntax, independent of the language beyond the router. So this is one benefit. It's, it keeps the configuration aligned and simple, even if, if we are hosting different applications in different languages on the same instance. And we'll have examples for this as well. Um, I hope you can see this, it's big enough. Um, this is a, the process overview um, of unit. As we said, this is the main process in version 1.20, our last one, um, with a couple of options. So you see unit is right now able to be controlled or configured via the Unix socket. Then we have the controller and the router process and see that they're running as non-privileged users. It's this kind of the same logic um, we have at the moment with Nginx. We have a main process that's running as privileged user, root in that case, and then we have all the other processes running under non-privileged user. Uh, what you can see here is that we have this WordPress uh, user. Um, so that means what we can do, we can create a run user on our, in, in the container or on a VM or an EC2 instance, wherever we, we install unit and can make use of this run user in the unit configuration. So that means unit can create a process um, controlled or run by a, by a specific user, in that case, WordPress. Um, so we have an application WordPress, we have F1 and 2, and we have a Django Python uh, project running a one unit instance. This is our demo here. So how to install or where you can get in your Nginx unit from? Um, yeah, you can use CentOS, Red Hat, Ubuntu, Debian-based systems, Docker, uh, or Mac OS on your MacBook, iMac locally. Um, so 
so I have a little asterisk here because um, what I've not put on this slide, but it's 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 required to do so, um, is you you have to configure the nginx unit repository on your system before you can you can jump install app get install app install whatever. Um, it's documented on the website, and I'll go ahead and paste the link to the repository configuration in the chat um, right at the point I'm done with my uh, with my part. Um, so you'll you'll have it definitely right after right after my talk here. Um, yeah, after you, you you configured your your environment and the repository is available, uh, you can simply go ahead and jump install unit. And the unit is the core module of Nginx unit. And then we have a couple of language modules, like for PHP or for Go, for Ruby, Python. Um, and this is something you can install alongside with unit. So installing unit as a core, and then depending on the language module, um, you can go ahead and install PHP, Ruby, Python, Go. Um, for JavaScript, it's different. That's why I picked this as an example here, um, because it's, it's better to do this a little bit more interactively. Um, yeah, the same for Ubuntu or Debian-based systems. And if, you, if you're familiar with Docker and if, if, you're, if you would like to get started um, without yeah, installing or configuring anything on your system, uh, you can use Docker as well. Um, I personally prefer the Docker approach um, because there is a base image called unit version at the moment. It's 1.20.0 at, at the point we're talking. Um, it, it may be different in a couple of months. Um, so update the, uh, yeah, the number, the release number if needed. Um, and then use the dash full version of it. And this will include all the language modules we're currently supporting. Um, so this is maybe a good starting point to play a little bit or hack a little bit around uh, with unit, use the Nginx unit full Docker image. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the configuration. So what, that's the next step. So we installed it, we pulled the Docker image, we can type Docker run, have a unit container up and running. And the next step is the configuration of unit. So how we can bring an application inside of unit. As I said, it's all dynamically configured with an API. Um, so what we can do is we can write a JSON file um, containing our configuration. And basically at the beginning, we have two different parts. We have the certificate section and the config section on the, on the root level, if you want to say. Certificates is like the placeholder for all our TLS certificates we can use in our listeners. And the config, holds a couple of other, other configuration objects. So this is, as you see, all the, all the, the paths uh, are printed here in the headline. So at the moment, we are in localhost slash config. If you notice here, that was just localhost. Um, so as it is all JSON based and uh, real objects, you can, you can dive into another section by just adding the object key at the end of your URL. So that means localhost slash config slash listeners will bring you all the listeners slash routes will bring you all routes. And uh, yeah, same approach for the, for the other um, objects here. Um, so settings are inter instance wide or unit wide configuration settings. The listener is the, is the, the, the main entry door to your unit server where you can say you bind an IP address at a specific port to the outside world where you can accept connections. Um, this is something we'll see in the demo. Um, we'll not go ahead and talk about the routes and the measures because this is a very complex um, topic. I have two examples in the next two slides where I will explain a little bit how they, how they works or how they work. Um, but these are the, the routes I've talked about earlier and they will control the behavior of our unit router. The application object, yeah, is the container or the, 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 the object where all our application configuration is, is placed into. The upstream directive is pretty new. This is for um, load balancing. This is something we'll not cover in, in the today's talk. Um, and the access log is something where you can say uh, where we should store the access logs 
to our, to our applications. Um, one slightly note on the access log thing, it is pretty handy when it comes to Docker to create a file here and inside of your Docker file, for example, um, create a symlink to std error or std out to, to this file. So with this, you will be able to see the access logs to your application uh, within the Docker logs. So just specify something var log access log, touch the file, make it empty, and then symlink it to um, std out or error. Um, yeah, the routes, uh, as I said, um, each route has a name and a specific, a specific match as well as an action. Um, the match is more of the routing pattern. And in case it's, it's matching the routing pattern, it will invoke a specific action. Uh, this is an example for WordPress, where you say if the URI contains something PHP um, or something .php slash or WP admin, we'll go ahead and send the request to this specific application. Or as a fallback, we can say we can try to serve a static file. This is the share directive. So that means if the user wants to, to, to see a CSS or JavaScript file or load it, um, we'll go ahead and check inside of our app home WordPress for um, the file. If it exists, we can send it. If it's not exist as a fallback, we will pass the, the request to the index PHP file in this case. Um, but as I said, this is, um, we, you can do a lot of complex things with the route matcher, just that you, that you saw that. Um, it's always the same structure, a matcher action. Um, then you have a couple of objects here, like URI and other request parameters. Um, so it's worth to check out the website. And I said, I'll, I'll go ahead and share the link in the chat. All right, so after we configured everything, um, how we can send the configuration to unit. Um, yeah, we're, 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 at the moment we are thinking it's, a, it's still the web socket, it's not a TCP port, it's socket, so we curl, use the socket, then we send the JSON to the config endpoint. Um, this is the, the overall approach, this will update the whole configuration, but as I said, you can go down in the path and say applications, my app, whatever it is, and then update a very specific part of the unit configuration itself. And this is, this is pretty handy. For example, if you want to update an, an environment secret or an API secret inside of one application, you can just update the secret by calling the applications app environment object and then the name of your environment variable, hit up, hit enter, and then at the next request, the API secret will be the new secret, just as an example here. Uh, what you can do with this dynamic, with this dynamic updates. All right, so this is now the part where we dive into the demo section. Um, as I said, I prefer the Docker way um, because it's, it's easy to test and it's, uh, there's one cool feature um, I, want to, I want to talk about. And there is one called docker entry point D. This is a directory inside of the Nginx unit base images uh, where you can place a couple of things into. You can put a JSON file in it and this will then be applied as the de default configuration. You can upload any PEM file you want and Nginx unit will then upload the PEM files into the certificate sections automatically. And if you place a shell script in this directory, Nginx unit will go ahead and run the shell script right after it configured the instance or uploaded the certificates. Um, yes, this is the part where we'll jump into our demo um, because we use all of those, of those features right now. Um, yeah, as I said, we have three different APIs. We have a space events API, an images API, and a planets API, all written in JavaScript with uh, Express and Node.js. And let's use the events API as an example here. Um, yeah, so as I said, this is our default configuration for Nginx unit. First, we specify the center for 8080. And here, this is 
the configuration to tell unit what to do with an incoming request. In this case, we sent the request directly to the application without intercepting any route policies um, and send it to applications API, this one. And yeah, as I said, this is, this is a little bit different for, for, for JavaScript. It's the application type external. We have external for Go at the moment and for Node.js as we use the system binaries directly. Um, for other languages, PHP, Python, Ruby, for example, uh, we have a unit language module. Um, this, is, this is a little bit different. So that means in th that case, we're handling the, the, the connection or the, yeah, the sending our uh, sending requests to, these, to this language module is in this case a little bit different. So for example, in PHP, uh, we use the server API of PHP um, to execute the, the PHP code. Um, yeah, a simple approach here is the working directory, where is our API located, and what's the starting point? In that case, it's the server.js file. Um, yeah, and as I said, the overall unit instance settings, um, where you can put a couple of different um, things in here, and they will be accepted instance-wide, so for the whole unit instance. All right, um, so let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the Docker file. Uh, let me make this maybe a little bit bigger. So as I said, we have a, the base image is unit 1.20 minimal. So without any language module, as for JavaScript, there is no language module uh, needed at this point. I go ahead and use that one. Then I added um, run user, and the most important thing is for JavaScript that I'll go ahead and install a couple of dependencies here, like Node.js and NPM at this point, as our Nginx unit HTTP package for Node.js will be installed in this container dynamically during the NPM install process. Um, therefore, we need a couple of requirements here. We need Node.js and NPM, of course. And to build uh, the unit HTTP module, we need um, make support with Python and G++. Uh, this is for installing the unit HTTP module. Um, right, then we copy over the API code. We are copying the unit conf and the install script. And as I said, we have this interesting Docker entry point directory where unit will automatically look for configuration and shell scripts and certificates. And a good question could be here at this point, why we are not sending the unit configuration to the Docker entry point directory if it's, it will be applied automatically. Um, let's have a look inside the install sh script and see why. Um, yeah, as I said, the unit way of handling Node.js applications is by changing the HTTP module, if you want, created by Node.js to something that's created or hosted by unit. Um, so therefore, we have to install it and link it into our current into our current project. And this needs to be done before we start our application. So in case we would we would send our unit conf file to the Docker entry point. Unit would like to apply the configuration before it run our shell script. Therefore, the node modules and all this stuff would not be there, and the application wouldn't start. And that's why we have this shell script and do all the things in one script. We're installing npm, the dependencies. We are linking the unit HTTP module, and then at the end we're configuring our Nginx unit instance by applying uh, the configuration. So this is our install sh script that will be run by unit right after um, it started. All right, so, um, so this is basically just a, 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 small, a small JavaScript project. The most interesting part here is the server.js file. Um, two things I wanna mention here that are important um, if you want to get started with Node.js and unit. Um, first thing is that we need this shebang at the very first line of the server.js file. 
This is not a mistake. This is actually needed. So make sure this is in place. And uh, another thing is that we are changing or like overriding the Node.js HTTP module with our unit HTTP module. So this one is required as well. All the rest beyond the server.js file, all the routes or services, controllers, this is, is all the same. This is like, this can stay as is. So there's no changes needed in here. Um, so what I want to do right now with you as part of my demo is to change this API content a little bit and deploy it to AWS and show you the scripts, um, how we did that. Um, so first of all, let's go ahead to the EC2 instance and see what's up and running. So we have three different containers. One is for events, images, and planets. Um, so let's see what is actually inside of our events API. All right, so as we see, there's one event name, data, text, Mars behind the moon. And now we'll go ahead and put a second event into our API and publish it or send it to AWS. It's all about preparation. So I have a text file here. Go ahead and change that a little bit. And there's even a better way of doing this in production, but I think it's totally good for the demo purpose. Right, then we put some we put some text in here. Some image URL. Okay. So this looks good now. All right. So now we have updated our API code and now we want to publish it. So what we're going to do here is we have some scripts. There's one, there's one build script. Um, and this is something I really like to do at the beginning of a project. Um, so what we want to do is we want to push our images or build our image and push it to our AWS container registry. So we have a little build script here that's building all, all our Docker images and sending them to, to the ECR. To the ECR. Okay, so this is push all. So while that runs, um, go ahead and explain it a little bit. There's not really rocket science or magic. It's basically a Docker build based on the Docker files in our uh, API locations, one, one for event, one for image, one for planet. Um, then we're building the Docker file, tagging them accordingly to our Docker registry. Um, and at the end, we are pushing our newly created images to the Amazon container registry. Okay, that's all done. It was just a small change. A lot of things were in the cache. So now we're going ahead and here, um, there's another script called deploy. Um, and it's doing basically the exact same thing. It's logging into the AWS Elastic Container Registry. Um, we're pulling newly created images and we are restarting our services. That's all the magic. So we do deploy, we're logging in. See the events API was changed. We're downloaded the layer that was changed. And then let's see. Started, okay, let's see, there you go. All right, so event number two is now published biggest full moon over the year um, with the text. Go. 
for, so as a small wrap up, what we have right now is we have on our developer machine, three different APIs. We have changed one API, but all the others working the same way. Um, we have scripts in place that can push our changes to Amazon Elastic Container Registry. And then we have another script running on EC2, pulling the containers with unit, running unit, and exposing ports on the EC2 instance. And this is something I'll go ahead and show you because this is important for Liam's session. So we have port 8085 and 8090 and 8080 on our EC2 instance, one port for each service. And yeah, next step at this point will be to configure our API gateway to make our APIs exposable, securely exposable to the, to the outside world. And at this point, I'm pretty sure we're at the, we the Q&A part. Um, and after that, we will do the 15 minutes, 15 minutes break. All right. So let's see. Yes, yes, yes. All right, so I think I answered all the questions as we went along. Um, but now is a great time to get into anything maybe in a bit more depth if anyone has any, mm -hmm. any questions about what this is all about. Um, you know, why doing it this way is better than maybe the way you're doing it. So yeah, feel free. All right, so um... First of all, Libby asked, so if you want to add the, this code to the GitHub repository for unit examples on, or changing the space example. Um, yeah, I'll go ahead and reconfigure or, or restructure this a little bit. And I'll definitely go ahead and upload the whole structure I've showed you here um, to GitHub. And there is a an unit example repository inside of the nginx project um, and i'll go ahead and share the link right after um, this or during the break no worries um, then there's another question from ryan um, is the unit piece used in conjunction with nginx it's almost like a runtime inside of nginx um, so the nginx unit is a completely separate product and project um, at, at this point. So you can use Nginx unit and Nginx open source or web server reverse proxy um, in the combination, but there is no really, a, so you can launch an API, for example, um, just with Nginx unit as well, using uh, the capabilities we just saw. There is no need of having an Nginx in front of it. At this point, if, in some, it makes sort. It might it makes sense in some sort, and this is something we will see right after the break. Um, but technically, there is you can serve the, the API static files and everything just with nginx unit. There is no need of having an nginx in front of it. Technically, yeah, I'll, I'll double click on that one. So, just as Timo said, there's there's it's a separate project. There's no shared code between unit and regular kind of Nginx web server. Um, Nginx unit can serve static files. It can do TLS, it can do proxying, load balancing, and it can run you know, your application code runtimes. Um, however, all of those, the features are just listed like load balancing and SSL. They're at, a, at an earlier stage of their maturity. So, uh, it's great to have those things in unit and they will become richer and richer over time. Uh, but typically we would say use Nginx unit for, uh, for your dev environment, for your testing environment. And when it comes to production, it makes, makes a lot of sense to deploy an Nginx web server uh, reverse proxy in front of that to get that, that richness of uh, your TLS and load balancing, et cetera. 
and we're at oh you might even be at time so i think that worked out pretty well Tina. hi this is liam at nginx and uh we have arrived at part two so we'll be on the break and uh, we're now going to be deploying nginx uh web server as a reverse proxy but more specifically as an api gateway so let's jump straight into it now in the first half of this workshop, uh, and if you didn't, uh, if you weren't there for Timo's talk, it doesn't matter. This is self-contained. But what we what we did, uh, what Timo did, was he deployed uh, a number of APIs uh, in Docker containers using Nginx Unit as the runtime. And now what we're going to do is we're going to publish those APIs, make them available to the big wide world. And to do that, we're going to use Nginx as an API gateway. So in the uh, in the red box here is where we are at. Now, Nginx is most commonly known as a web server, as I mentioned, or a reverse proxy, and sometimes also a load balancer, and sometimes also a content cache, uh, and many other things for driving HTTP traffic or even uh, layer 4 TCP and UDP traffic. But uh, what's that got to do with an API gateway? So let's, uh, let's answer that. So most, Ng most websites Use Nginx, we overtook Apache as the most popular web server on the internet uh, sometime uh, in the last 12 months. And what we find when we survey the, uh, our, our community, our open source user base, what is it that you use Nginx for? It's all the things I just mentioned, but API Gateway is one of the most popular use cases that we come across. And often it's an API Gateway as well as being load balancer or as well as being a web server or a reverse proxy uh, and that's part of what i'm going to focus here in on this workshop is uh, how you can manage nginx as an api gateway show you some best practice configuration uh, and i'm going to do a lot of this stuff live i'm going to do it from scratch and to do it from scratch i'm going to need to install nginx now the way that i'm going to do this is i'm going to install uh, nginx using the official repository that is hosted at nginx.org uh, and this link here will sort of explain how to do that that's not usually necessary uh, it's great to get the uh, the curated builds by the nginx team but you can also get from all of your favorite uh, you know, either from docker the official uh, nginx image or from your your uh, operating system uh, package manager will have nginx just there so you can do yum install apt install uh, usually when you do that, however, you're going to pull down the, uh, the stable branch. And we like putting new features into the mainline branch. So there are two. And it's often for those, uh, and when I, when I canvassed this at the start of the other session, uh, Nginx is, is widely used. And one of the things that I've come across when I'm speaking to folks is that uh, they don't know whether to use the mainline or the stable version. And as the operating system vendors tend to provide only the stable version, I thought I'd just uh, explain that before we go any further. So mainline is this outer red, sorry, red, it's green, uh, outer green uh, circle. And what happens is that it, we run our versioning on an odd and an even number. So one dot odd dot something, is our mainline branch and one dot even dot something is our stable so one dot 18 dot zero is the current stable one dot 19 dot three is the current mainline now mainline gets updated uh, every four to six weeks eight to 12 times a year uh, as where new features become available but stable is uh, is stable and the reason i that sounds dumb is because uh, it's stable in terms of its features it's not a description of the quality of the software. So when we put a feature into mainline, it's ready for prime time, it's ready for GA, uh, and in, indeed uh, the commercial offerings of Nginx uh, use the mainline branch for that. Now every year, around about April time, we retire the stable branch and we'll stop updating it. And then we fork mainline. And so sometime during April or May, the current stable version of Nginx is actually the newest version of Nginx available. So just as a, uh, a reminder that it's not about uh, the quality of the software, it's just about whether you're going to see features in that branch. So we fork mainline, stable gets a bump, so it will become the next 
even number. So April 2021 will have uh, 1.20.0. At the same time, we bump the version of mainline and we keep adding features and we keep releasing. And the only time that we'll update the stable branch, so currently 118.0, we would do a 118.1 .1 if there was a critical bug fix or a security vulnerability, that kind of thing. Uh, we'll never change the functionality of stable throughout the year, but every year it inherits all of the new features from the previous year. So choose whichever one uh, makes the most sense for you. Uh, I am going to go ahead and uh, jump. I'm going to be jumping between the slides and my terminal. Uh, so I'm logged in to the API Gateway uh, virtual machine on AWS, which is the environment that Timo's uh, got prepared. And uh, at the moment, uh, Nginx is not installed. So uh, I'm going to um, just do this as root and I'm going to install Nginx. Now I have uh, configured this machine uh, with the Nginx official repo uh, and it's in this file. In this, this is an Ubuntu machine, so it's uh, in sources.list. And here we just specify uh, that for Nginx, I'm going to pull it from uh, the nginx.org package repository. So that when I do an Nginx install, so an app install in Nginx, it's going to pull that from the official repository. Uh, I could pull the source code and compile it, um, but when you pull the packages, you know that you're getting something that was built by the same Nginx team that wrote the code, and it's super easy. So that's now installed. And if I do uh, Nginx dash B, uh, we do indeed have the very latest version 1.19.3. And if I change to uh, etc. Nginx, you will notice throughout this workshop that my typing is the least reliable thing of all. Uh, and we don't have a great deal. So this is interesting. Where are all my files, Liam? I don't seem to have an Nginx conf. So what I'm going to do is probably try and do this again. Um, this is what you get when you, uh, you do a reset before a demo. All right, so let's... Ah, I took a backup. I was clever. All right, not that clever. Um, Oh yeah, okay. Uh, I'm going to put these files back in place and then I think everything will be fine. Um, so let's drop them in here before I do that. So bear with me for 90 seconds while I fix my mess up. Conf.d is empty. All right. Um, so let's do that and then let's, let's copy the backup I made from Nginx um, to here. I've got my files back. And if I go in conf.d, all right. Don't need those. All right, one more thing. Okay, thank you for bearing with me. Nginx is now installed. And if I do an Nginx uh, dash T, there's my config. All right. So apologies for the hiccup. Uh, it seemed that when I uninstalled Nginx, it, uh, it was quite brutal. So I have my Nginx configuration file. You may have seen something like this before. This is the default that comes with the install. Uh, and the most important thing in here is that we have an include file. And the include directive means that we can uh, organize our configuration into different areas uh, and we can manage that in different files, which is great for making small changes without worrying about breaking big things. It's also great for when you have multiple teams. And in this case, we might think about having multiple app teams that are building different APIs. So I'm gonna consider Timo as the app developer. He's built this API that's themed around space. It's got space data. We had uh, we'll come and look at those in a little bit more detail in a sec. Um, but I might have some other APIs from other teams. I want to publish all of those. 
So I've got a vanilla Nginx install and in my conf.d directory, I have absolutely no files. So uh, if I were to uh, start Nginx, um, it wouldn't be listening or anything. So let's get started and let's get the API gateway defined. So I'm going to use a specific file in that conf.d directory uh, called API gateway. It's going to be my uh, listener. I'm going to expose initially my APIs on port 8080 and we'll, uh, we'll move on to a TLS config a little later. And then I'm going to create a directory to store all of my APIs in. So my uh, the space API will be the one we'll publish today. Uh, and then we'll just do a quick test of that. So here is the config that we want to write. I'm gonna uh, squeeze my terminal over so I can, I'm just gonna do this directly. So the first thing I'm gonna do is create my API gateway.com. So I might have a bunch of other web servers listening. Um, and so this allows me to isolate my API gateway configuration uh, from everything else. So I'm going to listen on port 8080. Uh, TLS config. Go here. And then I'm going to use the include directive for my own needs. Uh, I'm going to pull in anything from my APIs directory that is uh, a startup comp. And so I can have as many files in there, each of which could be its own, uh, each of which could be its, its, uh, its own API. Um, and the other thing I'm going to do, uh, which partially is for me just to test that everything is working, um, is that I'm going to create a catch-all location. So location slash for the, the, the root of, the, uh, of the, the server is going to be the location that Nginx will match a request on if it doesn't have anything more specific to match on. And what I'm going to do is say, if I end up here, send me a 400. I could say 404, but a 400 is better for our demo purposes because it means we didn't match any APIs that are published. So actually, your back client, go away. Um, rather than give away the fact that we didn't make a, we didn't find a valid resource. Also, if we see a 400, I know that this is now working. So that's all the config we need for now. Let's save that. Let's test our Nginx configuration with a dash T. It's okay. And actually, we didn't start it yet. So let's start Nginx up. Oop, yeah, you already mute. Uh, let's, maybe it was running. And now let's start it again. All right. Now it's started, and now if I curl to port 8080, uh, I will get the 400 response that I said should happen if I didn't match anything. And of course, I could put any old garbage in here, uh, and I still will get a 400 because there's, we're not actually listening on anything. But we have our listener in place. However, you'll notice that um, the response I got back um, isn't very API gateway like. So that's what we got. Now it's API gateway, but it's returning HTML errors, which is not super. So let's make it look like a bit more like API gateway, give our API clients a fighting chance of dealing with errors, and we'll define some JSON error responses. So this is how I'm going to do that. Uh, and what I'm, I'm going to use the error page directive. And what it does. Uh, if there's an error, the error page directive says, oh, well, if I caught this error, then do this with it. And on line 16, it's going to convert that error and it's going to handle it with a named location. And a named location starts with an at sign. Uh, and the nice thing about at signs is that you, they're not valid in URIs. So you know that no external clients can actually try and access at the at 400 URI. Uh, so it's used its internal only. So I'm going to send processing to the at 400 location. And in there, I'm going to send back the actual response. So let's go and edit that uh, API gateway file again. And lost my mouse. OK, keyboard it is. Ooh. Uh, so error handling, let's do this. So 
first of all, we're going to have a default type. So we'll send back, uh, if we don't know what type it is, we'll send back application JSON. And then we're going to say, if we get a 400, uh, then return it as a 400 and we'll use the 400 at 400 location to handle it. So here is the location itself. So we're going to return the 400 code, but now we're going to send back some JSON saying status is 400 and the message is bad request. Close that, close that. Uh, let's put a new line in at the end to make it a little bit nicer. There we go. Now, reload. And now when we hit, uh, let's see, hit the root for 8080, we get a JSON response. So we're looking a bit more like an API gateway. Now, that's great for a 400, but what about the rest uh, of all the errors that are available? So uh, for that, I do have uh, a file, and there's a, I do have it on my GitHub, so we'll share these with everybody later. And uh, tell you what we'll do is we will go take a look, shall we? Right, so here we are. There's 400, that's the first one we did. And now I've got all the error codes that we might reasonably expect to receive uh, from a, a backend or indeed from a client. So let's just grab the raw version of that, copy it, and I'll go back to my... So I'm going to create this directory for where I'm going to put uh, my APIs and we'll have the file Make sure I get the file name right. Uh, it doesn't matter. I can just call it errors JSON. It doesn't actually matter as long as it ends in a .com. Boom. There it is. So should I need them later? I now have a nice set of JSON error responses for any uh, eventuality. All right. Now. Uh, we're making some progress, but what we need now is uh, we're, we're aiming for a production API gateway here. So let's make sure we've got some, uh, we've got TLS in place. And we left a placeholder for this. Let's set it up now. I do have some uh, certificates I can use for this purpose uh, from Let's Encrypt. So we're going to make this API gateway available at space.nginx.org. I want to copy these certs in. I'm going to set up the 443 listener. Uh, now notice that in this example, we're still listening on port 8080, um, which is weird. So it is possible to have Nginx listen both on uh, plain text and on uh, SSL. Um, there's no good reason for doing that outside of testing. Uh, so, but it is uh, sometimes easy to leave the port 81, for example, in uh, after you set up TLS and uh, in order to secure it, which you lost. Okay. So firstly, I need my certificates. Uh, so I'm going to create a directory, Tetra Nginx process fell. Oh, did I already leave these in there? Uh, here they are. Isn't that handy? In which case I can go back to my API gateway and fix up my listener. Still no mouse, very strange. All right, so listener 443. This with SSL, otherwise it's just a plain text 443. Uh, we'll have an SSL certificate. Space to nginx.org dot cert and then private key. to index.org.key. Boom. Okay. Uh, and as I was recommending, let's stop this thing on port 88. Actually, I will. I uh, just remembered why. Okay. Now, 
By the way, index-reload will also test the config, so it will, it will shout if there's an error. And now, if I jump to my... Uh, I'm going to struggle without a mouse key. Well, I can do it this way. All right, so let's use uh, curl to HTTPS space index.org 4443 and a bad request so that must be my API gateway and this is public on the internet but please don't try and hack it or break it because it's not really that secure um, but later on uh, you'll be able to use the same URI and test some of the other things that I'm doing with the gateway and if it breaks that means I can blame the audience okay let us continue so we haven't done a great deal yet we've got TLS uh, we've got JSON errors. We haven't actually published any APIs, which of course is the, uh, the main idea. So let's get to that. We're gonna publish our first API. Timo in the previous session published uh, three separate APIs or three separate services uh, as, with regards to space. There was a, a planets and events that he modified on the fly. Uh, and there's also an images microservice. So you might think this is a space uh, this is the foundations of an entire space API or a space app. And what we're going to do is take those three separate microservices and use the API gateway to present them as a single API, which is a common pattern. Uh, and we've got different uh, URI elements that will be routed to different backends. So uh, slash API slash space slash planets is going to go to planets microservice, events to events and images to images. So we're going to go ahead and set that up and we'll publish uh, we need two things to do this we need to define uh, the set of backends and microservices where they are uh, and then we need to describe the routing rules for how the uris are actually going to get proxied to the correct microservice step one of that is we're going to define the backend service and i think i will uh, spare you looking at my typing uh, by pasting in this configuration here so you may remember from Timo's session that he exposed uh, three different Docker containers on three different ports, uh, 8080 for planets, 8085 for events, and 8090 for images. So they're encapsulated here. And uh, if I flip back to the... I think PowerPoint has robbed me of my mouse pointer, so I'm doing an awful lot of keyboardy stuff. Let's make sure this goes okay. So I'm going to put this in a separate file. And again, uh, I'm going to use a lot of use of different files that get automatically included by Nginx. Uh, there's not a hell of a lot of config that's going to go in here, uh, but it is good best practice to isolate different elements of the configuration into different files so that you can modify them independently. And there we are. So I pasted it in. We've got three different upstream blocks. Each of these can have multiple server elements. We've just got one container for each right now. But if you were to add more, you would then, Nginx would automatically start load balancing between them for every matching request. Uh, however, if we were to do that uh, in production, we would really want to define a shared memory zone so that each Nginx worker process is aware of any uh, errors detected, for example, uh, by a different worker process that had tried to reach the backend. So that in that doing it that way, you don't get uh, Nginx trying more than once to reach a failed backend. Uh, so all you need to do to enable that is to allocate a very small amount of memory, like 64 kilobytes, uh, to a shared memory zone like that. But I won't, uh, as we only have one, it really doesn't make a difference with this configuration, but production best practice use the zone directive. Uh, oops, I think I screwed that up. All right. Um, that is the back ends. I've got my mouse back. Terrific. Now let's define the API. And we're going to do this using uh, an unusual piece of configuration. We saw the location block earlier where we defined the catch all, and this is how we match on URIs. And so we're going to create a location for slash API slash space, because everything that we're exposing in this API is uh, below that URI prefix. But then we're going to be more specific and we're going to use a location block inside a location block to catch individual URIs. And then we can 
crops and then to different places. Uh, so there's two great reasons for using nested locations. Number one is that it makes it very easy to describe a routing policy for uh, inside a URI prefix namespace. We can have a default and we can also have uh, overrides. And we can be very explicit about which URIs are actually permitted and which are not. So we'll only proxy things to backend services that match a precise location. The other reason for using nested locations is that within the outer location block, we can put in policies and we'll do some of that in just a minute. Uh, and in that way, we just define the policies for this API one time. And if we want to be more specific, we can do so inside the inner locations. So I'm going to go ahead and set this up right now. Um, so let's open this uh, as a separate file for our APIs. I'm just going to call it space.conf. Here it is. Um, so I'll type in some of this and I'll paste in the rest. And Nginx has three different ways of matching on URIs. In this default location slash API slash space, anything that starts with that pattern will match here. Uh, but if I use the equals qualifier, then only the exact, uh, only the exact URI I specify here will match. So this it will be slash API slash space slash planets we have on a proxy pass to the planets service. And then we're going to be add another URI to say, if you it's API slash space slash planets slash something, so no qualifier, so it's a prefix match, then we'll also proxy pass to the same one. Now, why would I do that when I could just have a prefix? Well, if you have a, an API that you're, you're publishing, um, you might not want to send requests to it that start with API space planets one, 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 right? That, that's not actually part of my API. I only want to match on explicit things. And I could be even more explicit. And uh, if I had an open API spec, for example, I could make this configuration match what the open API spec uh, might define as all the paths in that API. So there are the two URIs that I will pass to the planet service. I'll paste in the others. So actually, I'm going to have to drop out of that to do that. So just to uh, show what's going on here, the tilde is the qualifier for regular expression. So here we have anything starting API space images and then ending with .svg or .png will match anything ending JPEG, which might exist at the back end that we don't want to expose JPEGs, won't match. And then finally, uh, we're going to match anything that starts with slash events to the event service. So here's our routing. And I'm going to need leave. Uh, I'm going to leave a little white space at the top uh, because later on we're going to come put some policies in here. Okay, let's save that and save that. And check that we didn't have any typos. And now reload the configuration. So this time, let's make some actual API calls. I can still get uh, here locally on localhost, API space planets. Excellent. That's quite big, isn't it? Uh, let's make that a little prettier. There we go. Uh, and if I were to choose a specific planet, there we go. But if I were to say planets that doesn't match any of the locations I set up. Uh, and so we're going to send a 404 back. Notice a 404, not a 400. I thought we had 400s for the catch all. Well, that's true, except that in our, uh, in our uh, 
outer location, we're matching here on API space anything. But because we didn't match anything in the inner locations, we did the index default behavior and we sent a 404. So this tells us that, okay, I've hit an API that's published, but it's not a valid URI for that, for that particular API. If I was to put something like some bogus characters in here, I'm gonna get the 400 because that doesn't match any of the APIs. So the API is published now, and I could also show that if I uh, show the regular expression match, if I go to local host, um, we've got a, a dummy image service here. So that's API space images mars.svg, right? It does return some metadata, but if I were to make that JPEG, we get a 404 because the regular expression said I'm only going to allow SVG and PNG responses. So just to confirm, the routing is set up. I'm just going to do one last check and make sure that we can also get uh, the events URI. Fantastic. Uh, and it's also got the, uh, the extra events that Timo added in the last session. All right, so the API is now fully published, but we have no policies applied. Very unusual to publish an API without any policies. Um, let's look at uh, a couple of those. And I think we'll be able to get through two or three policies that we can apply to this API before the clock runs out. First thing we're gonna do is rate limiting. Now, uh, Nginx is a very flexible rate limiting system. We configure it in two different places because we isolate the way that Nginx tracks and monitors the requests coming in from where those rate limits are actually applied. So we can monitor in the top line here, uh, all of the remote IP addresses uh, and with a measurement of them being at uh, you know, above or below two requests a second. And then later on, we could apply that rate limit in the space API, in a different API, or just inside one of, in, or just inside the planet's endpoint. Or indeed, we could have different rate limits for different URIs. What's more, there's five different policies that we can apply, or, beh or uh, behaviors, I should say, when a rate limit is exceeded. What we're gonna do here is uh, not delay. The default is to throttle requests, hold them back until the rate limit can be uh, achieved. Um, but for our purposes, we're going to just reject them flat out. There's a couple of other tweaks we can do, like allow a few over before we start limiting. So let's set that up. Now, uh, again, we do that in two different places. So let me get my mouse back. Since I have to do this by... Nope, all right, let's see what it is. Uh, so this is going to be uh, in the API gateway.com. So we're going to set up right at the top a shared memory zone. So another shared memory zone. So this is a piece of memory that all of the Nginx workers have access to. Uh, and we're going to say that we're going to use the remote IP address. That's the remote address variable. Uh, we'll give the zone a name called per IP. We'll give it an amount of memory to use, call it a megabyte, and we'll specify the rate. Uh, I'll do a two requests a second so that I can actually exceed it by hand. And let's then apply it in my space API. So, so we're gonna apply the rate limit from the per IP zone. And we said that we would not delay any requests, i.e. we will reject them. Uh, and the other thing we're going to do is we're going to control uh, what status code we send back if we exceed. So we'll use 429, which is the conventional too many request response. And I think we're ready to save that. And to save that as well, test the typos and reload. And now, uh, we use so let's go to localhost 8080 API space planets Mars there we go 
and I'll just make that uh, pretty so that we can see it nicely. And now let's run three in a row. Excellent. So the first one worked. And then of course, because I came from the same IP address, uh, the next two hit the rate limit. We got the code we asked for, and there's the message from our errors file that I used earlier. Rate limiting enabled, fantastic. Now, let's see if we can also add authentication. Quite unusual that APIs are published uh, fully public. So what we're gonna do uh, is look at our authentication options. We have, we have a good choice of authentication options and that's handy because APIs uh, don't have a, a standard. It could be many different things that we could use. We can use uh, client certificate authentication with X509 certs. We can use HTTP basic authentication with a username and password. We can use in, uh, maybe not all things open. Uh, we can use API keys by setting them up in a separate file. And we can also use an external authentication server. For example, OAuth tokens can be introspected by asking the identity provider, hey, I just got this token, please let me know if it's still valid. So for the purposes of, uh, uh, yes, for the purposes of this demo, I'm going to use HTTP basic authentication, but I'm gonna use it as if it were used for API keys. And again, we're gonna apply this policy under the API space, namespace. So all of the URIs that we match on will require authentication. I, if I were to use another different method, I might use auth JWT or auth request to make uh, HTTP calls. Um, the exception is the client certificates because that's part of the TLS handshake that actually happens at the API gateway level, not at the URI level. So let's see if we can get this done. Um, I do already have a file, so I'm gonna grab that. It's just got three uh, API keys in it. Oops, I'll try and copy paste this. Where's my browser gone? There we go. Here's the file. It's got client one, client two, client three, and I've just got some plain text keys in here. These would normally be encrypted, but uh, I explicitly overwrote that with the, uh, with the plain qualifier just for demo purposes. Don't do this at home. So uh, I'm create an API, another file, this one called API clients, paste those in. And then I'm going to, Open it inside. Um, edit the space API definition. There's a rate limit in there. Uh, I can put it at the top. All basic. What's the challenge going to be if I'm not authenticated? It's going to be space API. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, just double checking. Uh, and then I need to specify the auth basic user file and I call it apiclients.com. Oh no, 80 password. Uh, I should fix that. So there's configure, there's authentication now defined space. I just need to fix my typo. It's not a comp file. HT password file in Apache style. Now, let's go and hit that uh, Mars endpoint, and I'm getting a 401, unauthorized, which is exactly what we expected because uh, I need to send a username and password now. So let's have a look at that, that is API clients. And we'll use curl to send this in. So I'm gonna say I'm, I'm client one and my password is that and now I get the response uh, and if I modify that in even the slightest way of course it won't match I'm unauthorized again terrific so we've done quite a lot 
I'll skip the API keys. So we've got an API published with rate limiting, with TLS and with authentication. We've got five minutes to go. So I'm gonna save the rest of the uh, of these for uh, further slides. Um, I'll just show uh, other things that we can do, but I won't do live right now, is that we can control which methods are allowed for a given URI. So in this example, anything to flash events can be a get or a post, but that is all. The other thing that we can do is that we can validate that if it were a post, that the body that was sent in the request, the payload itself, uh, is JSON. And we can do that by using the Nginx JavaScript module to actually parse the body and make sure that it doesn't have any exceptions. And then we can add that configuration in uh, so that we force Nginx to pull the body in uh, and to validate that it's really JSON before it sends it to the back end, just in case there might be a JSON attack in there. So here's the ambitious list of things that I was hoping to get through. We did pretty well, we got more than halfway through. So with that, I will uh, pause for a moment. We'll take any questions that are left in the chat and I'll just bring that window open. Um, and while I do that, uh, I'll just leave this link up, uh, this page of links up for uh, uh, the resources that you might want to access. A couple of things that we mentioned along the way. Uh, there's also a developer license in here for Nginx Plus, the commercial version of Nginx, um, with the code there that you can use to get access. All right. Uh, Brian, thanks. Yes. Um, so what I'll do before we share this deck out with All Things Open is I'll we'll add in the, uh, the repo links uh, to Timo's code and to my configs uh, I used just now. Uh, and then you'll have uh, a great set of resources. I, I went through about a million different Nginx directories through this. Um, if you ever need the docs, the best kept secret uh, is if you go to nginx.org slash r slash something, directed name, proxy pass, auth basic, whatever it is, that will jump you right to the docs for that piece, uh, that, that directive. We've also got some good stuff on our, uh, on our website. There are a couple of blog posts about deploying into this API gateway. I will say they're a bit out of date. The best practice is what I showed in this demo. So this deck will be a better resource and we are in the process of updating uh, these blogs from a couple of years ago to bring them up to spec. Uh, so with that, I think we're about a minute out. So I'll just double check if there's any other questions. Um, feel free to drop something in. Uh, or if Timo, if there's anything that came up that, uh, that I missed, let me know. Yes, GitHub repo will be in the deck. Um, uh, much of this was done earlier today. So uh, the GitHub repo needs a little bit of finishing off. We'll make sure that's done in time for all things open to send out the deck chat flow. Brian, yes, method matching is here. So line 20, uh, you can require, uh, limit except means uh, block everything apart from the listed methods. So you can indeed do that. So you might add limit except get to all the regular URI. All righty. Okay, uh, one thing, I think we have a virtual booth. Um, around the conference. So I'll go ahead and check with our, yeah, with our persons hosting the booth. Um, if there's any chance of, of being around for let's say the next 30 minutes or so. So if you have questions, I think you can go and ask them in the booth as well. And that's, they should, they should find us <laughs> the questions and we'll have to answer. Yes, great. Timo, thanks. We're about out of time. So yeah, so benefits over Spring Cloud Gateway and Spring Boot. Um, basically, you're using Nginx. It's actually used by most of the API Gateway vendors anyway. Uh, so you, you're getting to use, uh, you get the most best performance by using Nginx in this way for your APIs. But we can go into more detail in the booth. So I don't want to overrun. Thanks everyone for, uh, uh, for staying on and um, hope you enjoy the rest of it.